Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Point Foundation's Out in Higher Ed Week. It's our closing panel discussion. My name is Thomas Roberts, and I have the great honor of being able to moderate this conversation uh, with three amazing scholars. And it's my great honor to be here, and I want to tell you more about the Point Foundation. Uh, it was founded in 2001, and this year, uh, Point is celebrating 20 years. We believe that two decades of helping LGBT, LGBTQ students uh, achieve their dreams. Uh, these are students of merit. Uh, the point is empowering uh, and, and promising these uh, promising uh, students uh, a future, a very bright future. I mean, these kids are so smart and they are dealing with obstacles at very young ages that I know uh, as, a, as a gay person that uh, I was too afraid to deal with at college level. And so I lied. And these are courageous kids that are doing um, a lot, not only in their personal lives, but as they gear up for their professional lives. Um, we even have a doctor here, almost doctor. We'll talk to him in a second. I'm a little mad at him, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> celebrate 20 years of the Point Foundation and the great work that they do. Uh, you know, there are uh, students achieving their full academic uh, scholarships and leadership potential because of Point's backing. Uh, and that's despite the obstacles that many have faced, whether it's from family or whether it's from society or whether it's from even self doubt. Uh, but Point has put out uh, a tremendous effort and backing in these students. And now 20 years later, think about all the impact that Point has had on our society and all the students, the scholars that have gone through that have already made, it, made a, an impression on this world and an impression on uh, these three scholars that you see in front of you that I, I know they probably all have like personal connections, I would imagine, with other scholars that they were inspired by when they first learned about the Point organization. One thing uh, that's very important is the support of uh, you know uh, folks, generous folks, uh, you know whether they're gay, straight, or Martian, uh, that believe in the scholars and believe in Point's mission, uh, because it takes money, mentoring, coaching. It takes it takes a village people uh, to turn out these wonderful students, uh, but they are already so impactfully smart. Like it's kind of easy work because they're really all, already brilliant. Uh, so I've been a proud supporter of Point for a long time, uh, and I could blather on forever. But I want to introduce you to my new best friend. They hope to bring perspective uh, as a direct service worker, a community organizer, organizer, a musician. A musician? What do they? Um, I DJ and I sing and I rap. Currently, you're attending Florida State College at Jacksonville. Um, you want to uh, attain an associate degree in art, and then in the future, you want to go to Georgia State University. Uh, and major in African American studies. Do I understand that correctly? Yes. Yes. And uh, where's home base? Right now, I'm currently in Atlanta, um, but Jacksonville is what I ride and die. Go Jags. <laughs> I don't want to show favoritism. Uh, so, Doctor, I'd like to talk to you now. Uh, Dr. Kelvin Moore Jr., almost doctor. He's in his first year of medical school, but I feel like uh, he could have helped me with a medical issue and he didn't. <laughs> But uh, Kelvin, tell us about you. Uh, yes, hi everyone. My name is Kelvin Moore, pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I'm a first year medical student at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, I've been in San Francisco for the past three years. Um, I call my home South Carolina, though I've lived sort of up and down the East Coast, was born in Japan, I've kind of lived all over the place. But um, yeah, being queer, was a huge part of my upbringing and it's a huge part of why I want to be a doctor um, and you know to sort of advance queer health. Uh, following the completion of your undergraduate studies degree in 2019, uh, you gained employment as a, a clinical research coordinator uh, working on several trials to improve preventative HIV care for queer and trans people of color that are living in San Francisco. So how, how eye-opening was that to kind of be on the front lines of that. It was very eye-opening moving here um, to see just the advances um, in San Francisco specifically in terms of, you know, creating healthy spaces for people living with HIV. Um, I will say there were very stark contrasts in who was covered and who was protected. And so looking at the racial demographics and the gender demographics, it was a lot of, you know, cisgender white uh, gay men who, you know, had a lot of protections and resources. And so um, moving to San Francisco, I wanted to specifically focus 
on you know those subsets, those communities that don't necessarily have those resources. So in in seeing firsthand, and I'm sure you've read about you know disparities of like that before, but now you've you know you've witnessed it, you've researched it. Um, you, you probably uh, thought with you know greater minds about what can be done to uh, lessen that burden. Mm -hmm. And like you're young, you're smart. What did you come up with? Really connecting with the community, going out into the community and meeting people where they are, not expecting folks to come to big institutions to receive care. Um, you know, really just bridging that gap is what it's going to take. Um, and, you know, an allocation of resources into communities that have historically been under-resourced. The personal connection is just so, it's, it, it's, it's it, you know, it's like, that's, that's it. And, and reaching people, like you said, where they are, um, cause some people, uh, I think, um, I know I'm a late bloomer. I'm slow to, I'm a slow learner. If there isn't like the, the, the right approach or there hasn't been historically the right approach, um, or even the right consciousness of, of we aren't approaching these people properly, um, or we're ignoring these people, uh, almost consciously, uh, you know, that's, that's a big problem. What, what, did you come out early? Like, I mean, you're already young now as it is. <laughs> yeah, I came out, uh, the first time I came out was I was 10. And then I came out again at 13. And then again at 15. What um, was this I mean, time? It okay. just kept getting a surprise party? Like, was, <laughs> like, like, hey, I registered when I was 10 for this and I almost got everything I wanted, the Sega or whatever. And then, you know, now I've registered uh, for the Xbox at 13 and at 15, I wanted a car. <laughs> No, that's what it felt like, honestly. Um, I think it was just, you know, really having to prove that, you know, this is who I am. I'm very sure of myself. I know this this early on, um, but I guess to other folks, it's more so it's too early for you to know. Well, isn't it funny? Because at 10, right, uh, um, there's this assumption that you're going to like girls, right? And there's no question of you having to announce anything about that. Specifically, my family, I think, um, at the time, it was very easy to hold resentment. And now that I'm older, you know, my family really did the best that they could in terms of, you know, being accepting and nurturing. Um, and they have grown as well as myself. Um, in school, it was awful. But um, yeah, I just didn't fit in, in middle school, especially. Um, yeah, it's sort of a hodgepodge of emotions. It's on my family's end, you know, maybe it wasn't the uh, reaction, initial reaction that I wanted, but, um, you know, they came around and now they're very supportive. Well, uh, so when you, when, when, who, who's in your 10 year old head? I mean, like your 10 year old uh, ear, uh, you know, like as a, I don't know, a sage or somebody that you're like, you know what, I think I'm gonna come out. Is mm -hmm. it just you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, honestly, I, am not good at holding things in. When I feel like I need to say something, I will say it. Um, yeah. And it, it was like that. So now at 20, 24, right? Uh, you've had more than half your life, uh, you know, out. Um, and uh, that's kind of a, a, a you know, great gift to yourself that so many of us don't get to have until like way later in life, you know, because we hide in plain sight um, and ignore um, you know, hard truths or, or scary things because of self-loathing fears or, you know, or even uh, proper fears of how people are going to react. Um, but wow, I'm impressed. You need to write a book. You know, I mean, that's very impressive. And the school you said it was bad, but was anybody cool? Like, were any teachers cool? Like, was anybody looking out for you? No. I actually uh, left South Carolina due to bullying from being gay. I went moved to a completely new state and new school that was a little bit more accepting and stuff. So, so is immediate family still there? Yeah, is all my family's there. Generations back, it's my home. It's yeah, it's where sort of my American history started. Raynan, will you introduce yourself? 
Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Thomas. And I want to start off by just thanking my co-panelists um, and thanking the Point Foundation for giving us this opportunity to speak today on LGBTQ rights in higher education. My name is Raynan, like the weather, I use he him his pronouns, and I'm currently a third year at Washington University in beautiful St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I'm currently serving as the student body president, also as a social justice chair of the Pride Alliance. So I've been very involved with different types of LGBTQ advocacy around campus. I'm studying political science, sociology, and women, gender, and sexuality studies, and I'm really excited to be here. So have you always been this smart and this like, uh, like confident, like outwardly confident and like a good public speaker? Well, first of all, thank you. That is uh, very kind. And um, that reaction, look at that. He's like, thank you. Um, I definitely was very shy when I was back uh, when I was younger. And one of the things I kind of developed throughout high school was my ability to kind of speak more fluently. Um, I was on the debate team and that's where I really found my voice and also my passion for advocacy and policy work. So that's why I believe I'm a, uh, so involved in those fields right now as well. But I, I definitely um, attribute a lot of it to uh, a lot of the folks around me who helped and supported me as well. So where's home base for you? I'm originally from Edison, New Jersey. A lot, uh, my immediate family is all in Jersey, um, but I also have family in China. My parents are both first generation immigrants and they migrated here to attend university. So my name is Rainin and in Chinese it's Rainin. So it means happiness and it means luck. And it's something that means a lot to me. It's one of the gifts that my parents gave me. When did you know and when were you, when were you identifying as part of the LGBTQ community? Yeah, that's a great question. I was in the closet for a long time. I am not ashamed of having stayed in the closet for a while. Um, I knew when I was, I really don't have a specific time that I found out in the same way that most straight people probably wouldn't tell you what time they found out they were straight. Um, I would just say that I basically realized when I was going through puberty that I was more attracted to men and that basically led me to the conclusion that I was gay. And it was a conclusion that I wasn't able to fully come to terms with until I was in high school. But I never actually came out to a lot of people until I graduated high school and went on to college. And that's why I'm really grateful that college has given me the platform and the opportunity to explore my sexuality and my identity and to be able to learn more about what it means to be gay and to find other people who are in the same boat as I am, which is people who are confused, who don't really know, um, you know, who, who they are yet, but who are discovering and finding their own identities. And I also wanted to say earlier, you said that you weren't brave enough to come out in college, but I actually think that people like you paved the path for us, Thomas, in order to be able to comfortably come out, to have media representation, and to be able to um, help us know that we are not alone in this. So I definitely, uh, it was very different about probably back when you went to college, and um, there's nothing uncourageous because uh, you have come out, you have continued to lead on this issue. And even if people are still in the closet, um, I hope that they know listening at home that they are completely valid and that no one should feel pressure to come out if they're not in a safe circumstance or if they don't feel ready yet. It's all about timing. And that's why I think I'm, I'm so fascinated uh, by you know, the, the, the three of you and, and your, your backgrounds and your stories because you're so young, you got it so on the ball. Um, Rossiella, for you, who were your touchstones to like learn from or to uh, lean on? Did you have that? I mean, because Point offers that obviously, and I think you guys have found you know family and, and um, um, you know mentorship and uh, guidance and you know people that have your back. Um, but that's not always you know when when you have it, it's great. But when you're not, when you don't, you're trying to seek it. It's hard. Yeah, definitely. I know for me as a young person, I navigated a lot. Um, growing up in the South, being Black, being Mexican, um, didn't have a lot of representation in the first place when it came to race. Then when it came to sexuality, identity, there was just always a lot going on there. And it's always been a journey. Um, when I first came out, I was definitely pansexual. I was lesbian, you know, all those things. Um, and I think when it came, when I came into a space where I was doing a lot more grassroots organizing um, with an organization called Girls Rock, which it uses uh, music as a vehicle to kind of teach young people about music and things like that. That's when I started to gain a lot more political education around what it meant to be non-binary, what it meant to be trans, what, you know, microaggressions were, what, you know, all this language that I just did not have as a young person um, to be able to be like, oh yeah, this is how I identify. This is 
what I feel. This is how I am. And um, it's, it's still a continuous journey. You know, I'm still finding out things about myself as I get more language and read more. One of the other things uh, that you learned, uh, yeah, this is how I'm treated. Yeah, um, definitely. I just had language. I had more people from around. It's an international program, Girls Rock. So I was able to talk to folks that were from Africa that were queer, to talk to people that were from Tokyo that were queer, um, to be able to have these like even international conversations around queerness um, and just oppression that like LGBTQI folks uh, face. Do you, do you feel that you have the support you need though uh, in, in terms of higher education where you are now? Um, are, are you being met uh, with, uh, I don't know, the, the kind of sustenance that you need to not only educate yourself, but to feel like you are growing and, and giving back? Oh yeah, definitely. I think um, it's been so great to have access to be able to be around point folks because yeah, in um, my little <laughs> college, community college, there isn't a lot of spaces where LGBTQ folks can come together, can share space together. A lot of that is what I've created in my own community as a DJ, you know, creating spaces for LGBTQI folks to come together you know, being on the ground, doing grassroots work, showing up, you know, shutting stuff down um, so that my community can feel safe and feel brave. What are the barriers, Kelvin, that you see now, uh, obviously through uh, the research that you just did, you know, being kind of a uh, front line, um, where, where the attention needs to go that would help and provide kind of that uh, fostering higher education safe space uh, for kids that might not feel comfortable talking about their sexuality? Mm -hmm. um, I think the most pressing barrier is probably the fact that there aren't out, I guess, administration or leadership. And so, you know, a lot of students may not feel comfortable fully arriving as themselves in these spaces. Um, and so speaking from sort of a medical education standpoint, you know, it can feel a bit daunting being myself and being out um, in spaces that are traditionally not that. Um, and so that's a huge barrier. I think um, it takes representation and leadership to create a culture that's more welcoming and acceptable. How important, Raina, was that for you in deciding where you wanted to go to college? Because as you said, you wanted to get through high school and then college was kind of your, um, you know, launch out time? So I definitely um, think it's an important factor in deciding uh, where I went to college, but thankfully most of the colleges I applied to were not known for having big problems with being hostile towards LGBTQI students. Um, there is a ranking of col colleges and universities that are homophobic and tr um, transphobic and have a record of discrimination against LGBTQIA students. And I recommend any queer students who are applying for college right now to look through that list to know where they want to avoid. Um, it was very helpful for me in deciding where I wanted to apply and where I didn't want to. So every choice I ultimately ended with was a college and university that I was very happy with. And I love my home here at WashU. I think it's a fantastic place to be LGBTQ. And um, I definitely think that it's something that factored into my decision. We still have a lot of work to do. You know, there's a lot of policy change that needs to happen. There needs to be a lot better dialogue when young people are pushing back against institutional power. You know, we're not seeing like institutions working with students who are shutting down campuses, who are protesting. And that's a huge reason why we have a lot of programs now like African American studies, you know, Asian American studies, women and gender studies, because students were demanding those things. They were shutting down their campuses, going to offices. So I think there just needs to be a lot more dialogue with students, you know, when they're coming up, when they're trying to have those conversations and pushing back against institutional power. How important have you found it to, um, uh, and Gross, Emily, you can talk about this directly because you, you brought this up about policy changes and stuff, but um, the important role, not only that we need to uh, demonstrate by showing up ourselves, you know, and, and uh, you know, being willing to, to do the hard work, but uh, having straight allies that recognize their power in assisting us achieve that equity. 
I think it's just more than showing up. I think it's a long, you know, um, friendship, a long journey that needs to happen, more reading that needs to happen, more listening that needs to happen. Um, but I definitely think it's more of like putting yourself, putting your bodies on the line to be able to show up um, and just to be able to uh, support, you know, when LGBT BIPOC folks are kind of going through what they're going through. I roll very deep with the gays, <laughs> very deep with folks who are in movement, you know. I try not to stay in those echo chambers. A lot of my day job, I work at BEAM, which is the Black Emotional Mental Health Collective. So we're teaching folks um, and skilling up folks around like mental health and healing justice. Because I'm here to educate folks and, you know, struggle with folks. But at the same time, like if you're causing harm onto me, if you're causing um, pain onto me, you know, you can't sit with me. And that's just that. <laughs> that's, they wore sweatpants on Tuesday, Graciela. They can't sit with me. <laughs> exactly. No, but no, no. I, I'm definitely here to struggle with folks. And I know that that's real. And that's for me anyway. That's how I see us, you know, getting to liberation and getting to freedom. Um, so that's just for me anyways, where I'm at. <laughs> I think most of us are wounded, you know, growing up because we feel different, um, less than, um, confused, only have ourselves to talk to, um, you know, for, for a good clip of time until we find that one person that we start to, uh, you know, we trust or we share with. Um, but sometimes you have, you have to exit through the wound. Um, and that's painful as hell. But it's that growth, it's that, it's that you know, uh, connection. Uh, Graciela, I think the, the, you're trying to, you're, you're referencing of like, you know, it's our shared experiences that bond us together, um, it's that struggle. That's where the compromise of understanding and loving each other is made, and even with our straight brothers and sisters, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I, 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 I found, I think it's so important to have their buy-in so important to have their buy-in, you know? Because otherwise, they can be a real pain in the ass. Just what I'm saying, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know? and I definitely think there's generations of that too. So that pain, that struggle. So. Well, and, you know, and the other thing is, and I'm sure you're going to learn this, is, um, you know, you already pro probably have in terms of, um, you know, all the uh, important work that you've been doing, like, for impactful change in society. But homophobes in power are dangerous folks. It's... Uh, Certainly something that, uh, you know, Gen Xers and above, like my people and above, uh, <laughs> more, more familiar with. And um, I think, uh, you know, other than Gen X, like, you know, almost ruining society with the Facebooks of the world and the Twitters of everything. I mean, we did do some other good things, uh, like, um, you know, try to clear some brush out of the way. Um, I know that was my intent, is there wasn't anybody, um, you know, there was, there was no, when I was, so I went to college in the 90s, there was no representation of uh, like, uh, you know, gay and lesbian people, um, uh, a, a queer identity, and certainly not in a positive way that was respected. Have you seen support, you know, at, you know, at higher education levels that directly talk about that, not just support for, um, you know, the, uh, whether, whether you, you know, your, your gender identity or your uh, sexual identity, uh, but the, the important mental health aspect that goes along with that and recognizing that that needs, uh, you know, to be discussed and addressed. Yeah, no, I mean, I know for me anyways, so like I said, my position more so is in the South and I definitely have not seen those conversations happening. We're currently still living in a pandemic. We are already in a pandemic, you know, with HIV and we're not seeing that, that, um, that help that a lot of young people have felt during COVID times, you know? Um, I know a lot of where my position is coming from. I was an HIV care coordinator. So I was working on the ground with some of the most marginalized people, you know, in Jacksonville, Florida, folks facing eviction, folks, you know, not being able to get their meds, folks not being able to get some of a lot of the essentials that they needed. And that all affects your mental health. You know, we have so many barriers there, you know, with young people not being able to see their doctors or not being able to get certain surgeries that they need because of um, this pandemic that's still happening and that's still very active um, and does not seem like it's slowing down at any point. 
Um, and that all affects your mental health, you know? Um, and then also on top of that, having access and being able to have access to a therapist, being able to have access to a black therapist, you know? We only have about 15,000 black therapists for 42 million black people. That's nowhere near enough, you know, um, access to care. Um, and then being able to pay for that, who's gonna pay for those things, you know? A lot of the um, times when I was working with young people, um, in Jacksonville, Florida, they weren't worried about getting their meds. They weren't worried about going to see a therapist because they're trying to figure out where they're going to live, where their next meal is going to happen at. Um, so yeah, there's still a lot that needs to happen uh, for young people to be able to have access to mental health. Well, I mean, like that's just basic survivorship you're talking about, you know, like roof over your head, the meal. Um, like it's a luxury then to think of trying to find somebody to help you with um, uh, real uh, you know, de depression, chemical imbalance issues that uh, impact every second of your life, right? And yeah. that's almost like just as important as the roof, you know? It's like, because that's gonna impact your decision about where the roof is and how, you know, how you're attaining, uh, you know, maybe the funds to pay for that roof. And it's like, so, uh, it's so important. And I think that uh, we are so, it's so taboo to talk about that or to admit, you know, I see a therapist, try. Right? I'm struggling today. We all go through that, all of yeah, us. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, for, for those of us that have felt other than, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, that takes its toll, um, takes its toll for sure. Um, in, the, in the final minutes here as we, as we wrap up, uh, Kevin, I want to ask you, as we were talking, you know, Graciela mentioned, um, you know, living through this pandemic and you know, we still have a pandemic, you know, it started with HIV AIDS. Um, it's become uh, you know, survivable. Um, but what do you fear uh, as, the, as the biggest missed uh, problem right now um, with how we talk about uh, mental health and also, um, you know, within the LGBTQ community, it's kind of like a, um, the most obvious thing that we miss, you know, that, we, that we're missing all the time. Just the validity of mental health and mental illness. And I think as queer people, as trans people, um, especially of color, you know, you have to build these barriers to sort of shield yourself in the world. And in doing that, you are suppressing all of the hurt that you encounter on a daily experience um, or a daily basis. And so I think, um, What's most pressing right now, I love that, you know, mindfulness and wellness is like huge. It's kind of like a buzzword, but I think especially um, in the LGBTQ community and for LGBTQ people of color, um, you know, really sitting with how you feel and really trying to unpack, you know, your suppression of feelings. I think that's what's really important right now. And that's going to lead to, you know, a journey of healing. Well, and, you know, the, the, uh, for you guys too, um, you know, spending your, your higher education years dealing with the pandemic, like dealing with isolation, um, that had to be really hard. You know, I mean, uh, you don't, you didn't have it, right? So you don't know what you might, have, like what you missed, right? So we have, we, get, we have what we got, okay? Um, but so my experience, you know, college didn't have that of, of the impact for, for you all. Um, and I think that that's, uh, and certainly for kids like say younger, like the high school kids that didn't get certain socialization things of like say a prom or this, or you know, going to the football games and those moments, um, maybe being in the school play or the things that were like gonna be their, um, like that's their, like, I don't know, their, their, you know, their moment to like figure it all out for, to figure out the next big thing in their lives. Like every, we all had pause because we went through some weird wormhole. I think we're coming out of it though, but went uh, you know through this weird time and uh, you know so I wonder what that's gonna do down the line like where where that injury or where that impact you know um, comes out for you know your generation you know I think um, there's this need to always be resilient and it's like forced resilience um, and yeah I think just to my earlier point I think we all should just like take a step back and really evaluate how we're feeling and, you know, acknowledge that it really is okay to be unhappy or to be angry or to be frustrated. 
Um, and I think something that really warms me um, in light of COVID-19 is listening to a lot of queer elders who lived through the HIV pandemic um, and how, you know, the government basically left them to die. Um, and so I think hearing their resilience, and again, it's forced resilience, no one should ever have to deal with what, you know, they dealt with, but, um, you know, hearing their resilience, that gives me the courage uh, to continue each day. And it also makes me want to be an even, uh, or it really propels my uh, desire to become a doctor because I want to, you know, take care of other queer folks. As I get weathered in these free clinical years, I'm just realizing what makes me feel grounded is connecting with people of color and being in community. So I'm leaning towards primary care right now. Excellent. Now, Raynan, 20, uh, other than president of the United States by, I don't know, 29 or 30, uh, mm -hmm. what do you do with your life? After college, I definitely want to continue doing work in the space of organizing and policy work. I'm very interested in kind of tackling some of the challenges that we're seeing on college campuses that Graciela mentioned um, and how they kind of play out in the broader um, real, real world, quote unquote. Um, I think when we talk about LGBTQIA issues, we also need to remember that all of them are intersectional and that they're not just about, uh, we, we can't only focus on gay people or only focus on trans people without recognizing that the LGBTQIA community is big and it includes people who are low income and people who are um, BIPOC and people who are disabled. And how are we going to make sure that when we try to fight for um, the advancement of civil rights and freedoms for all people that we inc are truly inclusive of all people. Um, I'm very interested in doing more work like that in the future. And um, I'm hopeful that I'm able to continue that work with nonprofits or the public sector, however it may look like. Well, it's so important because, um, you know, as we, uh, you know, you know we, we exist in our acronym, you know, as a family, as a, you know, as a bonded unit, but we have individual, uh, you know, life qualification interests that we need to, you know, have uh, made real, right? And sometimes like, you know, the ball gets kicked down the lane further, for, you know, one part of us than the other part of us. And, but we still need our brothers and sisters over here to support us over here while we're, you know, while we're, while we're struggling with that. And then we got to show up, you know, for them uh, when, when their time comes, you know, like, uh, and that's, that's like the, the you know, symbiotic relationship of, of uh, support that uh, I think we've gotten better. Like we're not, you know, it's got, it'll continue to get better, right? That's, that's the only thing we can do is, is uh, you know, achieve uh, a better relationship in helping each other. That's why I love point. I mean, I just think it's like, I can't imagine having had, like, was it like a light bulb moment or like some, like, whoa, like the skies over when the first time you ever heard about point, like, I am gonna, I'm gonna be a point scout. Like, what was that like for you, Russell? It was amazing. My partner was actually the one that told me about point. Uh, they were a finalist, but they didn't get it. And so <laughs> they were so supportive of me, though, and were, you know, walking me through everything. And it feels so good. You know, I haven't been in school in about six years. You know, I was in a super bad car accident which caused me to uh, kind of drop out of school. So this is the first time I've been back and my whole, everything is paid for. I got a brand new laptop and it just has been so helpful and so encouraging to have a community that I can go talk to and you know know that I can go have higher education and thinking about going into a graduate program. You know, those weren't things I was thinking about when I was 17, when I was 18, um, when I was in high school. I didn't have, you know, folks cheering me on. And I think realizing now that I was trying to do it by myself. And it's like everything that I've come to realize it takes a community um, to get you there. And so it's been so great to be like, yeah, I'm a point scholar. Like this is amazing. This feels so good. I've never had a scholarship before, you know? Um, so this is the first scholarship I've ever received. You are, and so, yeah. you are a student of merit. You know? <laughs> Ashe, yeah. So it feels so powerful. It feels so great to think about longevity and academia and, and bringing myself, like I said earlier, you know, as a grassroots organizer, bringing that, you know, as a care coordinator, working in nonprofit sector and bringing all of that, you know, into academia is something that has felt so liberating and so affirming. So, Rain, for you, 
what, what, what was it like? I mean, when you discovered what point existed, and then you're like, I want to do that. And then you're like, okay, we like you. You're going to be a point scout. It was an unreal experience. It was only a few months after I came out that I found out about the scholarship. And actually the reason I got it in my year or that I was able to apply was because the deadline had passed and then they extended the deadline. So in that oh. extension period, I found out about the point scholarship. And then from there, finished the entire application, poured over that application for like 20 hours in a row. I mean, it was truly a time. And um, at, at the end, when I got the call, it was unbelievable. Like I was so emotionally ready to, to hear the, you know, we regret to inform you. And then- <laughs> you're, ready the you're ready for the thin envelope to come in the mailbox. To say, right. uh, that's a, yeah. <laughs> I know. And, you know, getting the call. I was, don't tell anything anymore. I know kids, it's emails and everything like that, but I'm old. And I used to get thin letters that said you rejected. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was definitely um, a really un, unreal experience. And I think another reason of why it was so meaningful is because the point uh, community is such a strong community of people that I had never, ever had in my life before. Yeah. And I think being part of this community made me feel really seen. It made me feel like I could pursue my education and not have to worry too much about, you know, the student loan debt and the expensive cost. And I was also able to get a laptop just like Graciela. So I'm really grateful for all the financial opportunities, all the mentorship opportunities, and especially the amazing community that the Point Scholarship has offered me. And Dr. Kelvin, how about for you? Because being a doctor, that ain't cheap. Trying to, you know, make it to do not cheap. And not cheap at all. Um, the Point Foundation has helped me tremendously in terms of being able to buy the stethoscope, buy a laptop, you know, buy an iPad so that I can stay up to date in class. Um, and then, you know, as Raina and Graciela mentioned. Good stethoscope. It's like a top quality stethoscope. It's a good one. It's the Lipman 4. Um, but having that mentorship and community um, is very important. And I think about when I was a child, how I would have loved to be around just like queer people, um, you know, just pursuing their dreams in academia. And so to be in that space now, I am so humbled and grateful. What would you, what would you tell 10, 10 year old Kelvin, like now as 24 year old Kelvin, uh, about the idea to come out at 10, would you tell them to do that again? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, <laughs> it has not been easy, um, but I'm so thankful for all the trials and tribulations. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't change a thing, right? No, not at all, because I'm here now and I'm very happy. Maybe the only thing you would change is uh, more uh, coming out parties that make them annual instead of like those two year gaps. Go. Yeah, I get <laughs> Well, guys, I want to say thank you so much for time and your stories and your kindness uh, to me tonight. Uh, and I am so honored uh, to have this time with you. And I am so pleased that I got some tears out of Graciela. I was trying to get them out of all three of you. Raynan, I don't think there's anything I can teach you because you've got it all under control. And I'll see you at the White House. Uh, doctor, uh, I will see you in a couple of weeks uh, with my all specialist. Right. <laughs> and... Uh, Again, I wish you guys nothing but the uh, best of everything. And uh, no, I support you however I can. Uh, from here on, forevermore, uh, please let me know where I can. When all of you want to be journalists that none of you want to be, uh, I'm your man. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. No, thank you, guys. All right, be good and go out there in the world and make point and all of us very proud, you're a point scholars. <laughs>